You are listening to the Body Charge Podcast, and I'm your host, Sandy Sanderson. Today, we're going to talk about how can endometriosis be relieved naturally. Endometriosis affects over 360,000 Australians and is the most common cause of chronic pelvic pain for women. Current non-surgical treatments such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, oral contraceptive pills, and hormonal treatments have limited effectiveness with troublesome side effects for many women. Laura Ibragimova is a holistic wellness coach, helping women with chronic reproductive health and hormone disorders. She was diagnosed with endometriosis at the age of 24 years and went through medical treatments, including surgery and hormonal suppression. However, this debilitating condition returned within a year. Laura didn't give up. She decided to take control of her health rather than be a victim of her illness and worked out a protocol using natural methods to support her body to recover. Laura uses an holistic mind-body-spirit approach to coach her clients, including nutrition and stress management, such as yoga and meditation, and including magnesium-rich foods and supplements. So Laura, thank you so much for being our guest on the Body Charge podcast. I'd like to start off with um, asking you, how would you describe endometriosis? What what is it exactly? What are the causes and what are the symptoms? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Endometriosis is really a complex inflammatory disease of the female reproductive organs where tissue similar to the endometrial lining of the uterus finds itself outside of the uterus and in the abdominal cavity. It's typically labeled as a hormonal imbalance. However, new research shows that it's actually an immunodeficiency tied to your gut microbiome, where more than 80% of your immune system is developed. It feeds off of excess estrogen in the bloodstream, which causes lesions, cysts, and scar tissue to form on the abdominal wall and the surrounding organs. And that's what really leads to a significant amount of pain and discomfort. And because it uh, feeds off of excess estrogen, that's where the hormone imbalance conversation comes in. One in 10 women are diagnosed with this disease worldwide. But because it takes an average of eight years to reach a diagnosis, I personally believe that that number might be a lot higher. And it's diagnosed through a laparoscopic procedure, which is surgery, where doctors will remove the endometrial adhesions and then biopsy that tissue to confirm that it is endometriosis. And then from there, doctors will prescribe hormone therapy or birth control. It sounds very um, invasive, doesn't it? It's quite complex to to even diagnose is sort of not like PMT where you've got a set of symptoms you feel swollen in the abdomen and with that drawing kind of a pain so most women will can identify with with PMT but um, not all women get uh, the the endometriosis Um, so is that a a progression of the symptoms we get with PMT is it like a worse form of PMT premenstrual tension? It's not, uh, it can be, and it can be an indicator of endometriosis. Um, however, there are other things associated with um, endometriosis that make it that specific condition. Bloating can be common just because of, um, you know, just a little, we're holding on to more water retention and just like that time of the month that there's, there's just like a chance change in hormonal balance, but uh, endometriosis is a way more severe condition than PMT. So, so is the expression of it very inflammatory? Do you get inflammatory markers? Is, are that, is that one of the ways that they diagnose? You have, like you have a blood test, for instance, and you're, you show up with in, inflammation in the body? Yes, so um, blood tests are more of a newer form and more recent. Uh, The gold standard is still laparoscopic surgery. So to um, respond to your earlier question, it is a very invasive process. And that is why a lot of women uh, don't get their diagnosis until years down the line. Um, Recently, they have come out with some imaging tests that can determine but not confirm necessarily until they actually take out the tissue and biopsy it uh, so that you can detect it or 
assume that, you know, highly assume that you do have it through imaging, um, such as an MRI or a sonogram, if you do have uh, very large cysts that form. And some blood tests will also determine because it is a highly inflammatory condition if you do have high inflammation, but that could also be indi an indicator of other things as well. So laparoscopic surgery is still the gold standard for diagnosing and treating the condition. Is, is that linked with symptoms of fi fibroids, you know, where you have the lumps uh, or you have bleeding intermittently or after intercourse and when you shouldn't be bleeding? Is that similar or connected or associated? Yes, yeah, so both conditions are due to estrogen dominance or excess estrogen in the bloodstream, but they're different, and you can have them at the same time as well, but they're different um, diagnoses. And the difference between one of the differences between endometriosis and fibroids is that uh, with a laparoscopic procedure to remove both of the material or the scar tissue that forms, where the tumors that form with endometriosis, there's a high recurrence rate, up to 62% of uh, women with endometriosis will have a recurrence within two years versus with fibroids, which only grows on the uterus, by the way, endometriosis can grow anywhere in the pelvic wall or pelvic area. And, and in some cases um, spread throughout the body as well. Endometriosis, um, I'm sorry, fibroids will only grow on the uterus um, and can be removed and there's a 90% chance it won't come back. Right, interesting. So the link between the two is uh, uh, sensitivity to estrogen or too much estrogen, or perhaps mm -hmm. estrogen mimicking chemicals we might be exposed to. Yeah. And so, so the, the link is interesting also that you mentioned before with the gut microbiome. So is that that's a trigger to lead to downstream to the development of these inflammatory conditions. Is that right? Um, you might have some, is that mi migrating bacteria that come from the bowel? So it's a really interesting concept and um, more research needs to be done on this. And it's a bit of a chicken and the egg debate here because um, a lot of research will state that and you're born with endometriosis or endometrial um, cells that are found in ectopic locations. But the study that I came across that talked about it being linked to the gut microbiome and an immunodeficiency is that they did, they ran um, tests on rats and inoculated them with endometrial tissue. And these were completely healthy rats with healthy microbiome. Um, and they found that within 42 days of the presence of endometriosis, it destroyed their gut microbiome. Specifically, there's something called the estrobilome in the gut that is a cluster of cells designed to specifically to metabolize and eliminate estrogen from the body. So what it did here with the presence of endometriosis cells is that it destroyed the estrobilome and created an imbalance in the gut. So that's where the connection lies. So if you, um, if you were born with endometriosis or it was triggered somehow through gut health issues or, or some other. You can situation. inherit it, can't you? As you're being born, you inherit your mother's gut microbiome. Yeah. So it can be inherited and it can lead to gut health issues. And the part of the symptoms with endometriosis have to do with a lot of gut issues as well, such as IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, digesting, digestive problems, bloating, nausea, vomiting, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of times when women present to their doctor and they tell them about their gut health issues, they're misdiagnosed with a digestive disorder rather than a reproductive health disorder. Yes, yeah, so, so there are two sides to the same coin, really. If we're not digesting food properly, then we cause acidity in the body and that creates a, more of an environment to attract pathogens to then mm -hmm. migrate. So we kind of cultivate the wrong kind of microbiome in the gut as we become more acidic. And then that triggers an immune response. The immune white cells have to go in and try and clean up the mess, um, which, which can, I guess we, we're um, moving towards how you solved your own problem, which is very interesting at the tender age of 24, um, that you had all of these um, symptoms and they weren't able to be fixed. Um, that must have been, you know, a horrible experience for you at that age. Um, you know, we're, we're young and self-conscious and, you know, we just want to get on with life and, you know, meet a nice man and have a family and all of those normal things. And then suddenly you have to deal with these 
issues to do with your reproductive system, your, your gut health, reproductive system, it, was it? Um, how did you manage to get over it and, and think outside the box when the standard treatments weren't working? Yeah, it was definitely a very rocky experience. Uh, when I was first diagnosed in my early 20s, I had absolutely no idea about endometriosis. I never understood my reproductive health at all. So I didn't even know what the process involved. So when I started working with doctors, I just followed exactly what they told me to do. And um, when I asked, you know, we, we did have the surgery, we did, uh, you know, proceed with hormone therapy as well, which is very standard. And when I presented with symptoms again, they just said, oh, you know, here's another medication you can try and come back when you're ready to have a baby, um, which is, you know, not helpful at all because it is a progressive condition. So when my symptoms presented themselves again, I just felt very defeated at first. And I said, okay, well, if the traditional way of working, of managing this condition isn't going to work for me. And this is my personal experience, but I know a lot of other women have had this experience as well. Um, and then I have to figure this out for myself. And so I just made sure to, you know, focus on the areas of my life where I knew I had control in order to regain my health. And that the first place that I started was really laying the foundation for myself by studying the disease and what it was doing to my body. I also focused on getting the right bio data through blood work and other labs to really understand where my deficiencies were. Um, I improved my nutrition. I started to manage my stress better and get more sleep. And all of this was an effort to boost my immune system so that my body can focus more on healing rather than surviving, which is the state that your body is in autonomically when it's in a highly inflammatory state. Yeah. Did, when did you discover that the connection in you was also part of how you digest food and your, your gut microbiome? How did you deal with that and solve that? I would say about two years ago or over two years ago, when I started to feel really chronically fatigued and it was starting to affect, affect other areas of my life, including my relationships, my career. I had a prior career in healthcare consulting here in the US. Um, and it just started to really take over my life. And I couldn't, you know, even get out of bed in the morning sometimes. And so um, I decided to really learn more about my body. And I met with a naturopathic doctor because I felt like the doctors that I was talking to were not doing the right tests. And so with a naturopathic doctor, they go into, you know, they, they have a different methodology. And so they ordered tests to really determine where my new uh, deficiencies were. And from there, I was able to learn more about my gut health because, you know, you actually get the labs, um, they present the information to you. And uh, we, we saw how imbalanced my gut was, and that was leading to a lot of the symptoms that I was experiencing. And so from there, I decided to focus more on boosting my immune system and supporting my nutrition better. Yes, yeah, so it's a cellular approach, and we know the gut microbiome is the center of everything. It, it, um, if you're not digesting food properly, you're not going to get all of the nutrients out of what you eat. Even if you think that you're eating a fresh, healthy, organic diet, if you haven't addressed the issues of how you digest that food, you're still not going to get everything that, out of it that you need. So, um, you know, with did you do any cleansing or detoxing? Did you do any um, enemas or fasting? Um, how did you treat your gut? So when it comes to detoxes, it's a bit of a controversial topic. I didn't, I had to actually do enemas a lot when, before I started my treatment for endometriosis, my holistic treatment, because I was just struggling with my bowel movements and they were not functioning properly at all. Like there would be times where I would go weeks without going to the bathroom and would have to relieve myself through enemas. Um, I mainly focused on eliminating the source of aggravation, uh, which are highly inflammatory foods. And I, so I eliminated that from my diet. And that's when I realized that my bowel started to move better and improve my digestion overall. Um, I also focused on taking supplements that were supporting gut health, uh, probiotics and eating more prebiotic foods, also more cruciferous vegetables, which are very important for binding to the excess estrogen in your bloodstream and eliminating that as well by supporting with the fiber. 
and um, also imp improving my sleep quality. And other supplements that I took were also there to help uh, restore the intestinal lining so that yes. I wasn't having the food and the bacteria and all those particles free floating in my system and triggering yeah. additional inflammatory response. That's quite common with the IBS, that loss of the mucosal lining, which mm -hmm. houses our beneficial gut bacteria and the immune system back, um, cells, the white blood cells. Um, they need that gel-like uh, mucosal lining and also that provides the movement of the feces and the peristalsic movement everything kind of depends on the health of that lining so it's really important and what, what happens over time with stress uh, the wrong kind of foods uh, many factors contribute but we can become quite acidic and I, as I mentioned before the pathogenic bacteria can move in they produce even more acids so acids dissolve us and that then starts to erode the lining. And then some bacteria can move in that can actually eat, eat your gut lining. <laughs> they munch on it, the proteobacteria. So it's um, very, very important. We pay attention to gut health, not only for endometriosis, but for many conditions that kind of stem from there. It's the trunk of the tree, really, for, for all of our health, for immune system um, we, we're in an environment where there are bugs everywhere floating around, but if you have a healthy immune system, they don't get you. You have a great defense and you, you can push them out um, quite easily. But if you're dropping your immune system defenses, then of course you're more prone to catching things that you encounter in the environment. So we see that with very young people and children, you know, they process bugs very quickly. They have you know, some sniffles and um, maybe a little fever and, you know, they get over it quite quickly. Um, but the older we get, uh, the slower that process happens. Uh, and with elderly, you know, they can, it can be very debilitating for them to have these kind of issues. And of course, the older we get also, the digestive system isn't working as well as it should either. So we need more help from, as you mentioned, the, the vegetables with the fiber and the water, because fiber in those fresh vegetables brings water through and enzymes and enzymes are essential for um, helping the body to eliminate waste. And uh, so avoiding, of course, processed foods, which are dead <laughs> and don't have all those good nutrients and enzymes in them. Uh, so it sounds like you've done all the right things. And, and did you, had, when did you come across magnesium? Because I noticed in your um, uh, description before that um, magnesium was an important factor for you. How did that help you uh, alleviate symptoms or, and contribute to your um, gut health? Yes, yeah, so magnesium is a very important mineral in the body that, you know, I went throughout my research, I learned that it is responsible for over 300 biochemical reactions in the body. Um, and we tend to be magnesium deficient, especially if you're taking on a Western diet and not eating a lot of magnesium rich foods or supplementing. Um, I originally started with magnesium citrate to help with, the, of course, the digestive issues and, and the challenges with the bowel movements. But then I learned more about the different forms of magnesium that help with um, the cramping, which um, can really support, you know, during the menstrual time, during your period, can really support with the pain and alleviate the chronic cramping and, and additional symptoms uh, that you might be experiencing. It also, I found helped a lot with sleep. So that was something I was also struggling with, um, not being able to get sleep. I had adrenal fatigue and a cortisol imbalance. So that led to me be waking up very tired and restless, but then having a burst of energy at night and not being able to fall asleep until two, three, four in the morning. Um, and so that became very problematic for my energy levels and concentration and so forth. So uh, magnesium can actually help to uh, improve the, your melatonin production in your body, which helps to manage your circadian rhythm and your sleep cycle. So once I started incorporating more magnesium into my body, I, you know, just started to feel more relief with symptoms and also better sleep quality. So that's yeah. one of the best things that I've done. Oh, so far. Sleep, sleep is your best, best vitamin. Um, it's yeah. the time where the body repairs tissue, cleans out mess and waste products. And if we don't get that deep sleep, like the really restful sleep, I'm not talking about, you know, nightmares and tossing and turning, but really super deep sleep. Um, the restful sleep is when we really recover and 
feel refreshed the next morning. So what happens if you don't have enough magnesium? Your adrenaline um, pr pr produced by the adrenals, so they produce the stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, they um, start to um, be produced at the wrong times of the 24-hour cycle. And as you mentioned, you get revved up at night and then you can't get up in the morning. Also, it could be indicative of hypothyroid, so low thyroid as well. And um, what happens with magnesium, it dampens down the stress hormones. So it's like a seesaw. As you lift the magnesium, the stress hormones subside which then allows you to move into that deep restful sleep because you haven't got things stirring you up. So, so your cortisol cycle should be getting revved up in the morning when you get up after the sun comes up and should be subsiding at nighttime when it's very dark. And the darker it is, um, the better you sleep. And then the, you start, your pineal gland produces melatonin, which is an excellent antioxidant. It helps detox your um, cerebrospinal fluid so the brain and the and the the central nervous system um, and that's why you feel so good when you have a restful sleep and wake up the next morning and so we're coming back to stress really stress is the beginning of a cascade of many different kinds of disorders because stress um, causes you to lose magnesium excessively and the lower the magnesium the more acidic we become so the acidity then causes uh, deterioration in the body, um, a damage um, and inflammation. So when we have waste products not able to be eliminated, when we have pathogens moving in, you know, bacteria and, and fungus and things that shouldn't be there, the immune system is revved up and then that causes swelling and swelling causes pain. And so um, using magnesium to treat the symptoms not, not only treats the symptoms, but also helps the body to support the immune system to recover and solve the problem in the first place. So it does a multitude of things, as you said, over 300 different functions, and it's the master mineral. So, um, and, and topical use, especially if you have digestive disorders and find it difficult to digest food or you have any kind of IBS issues, uh, transdermal absorption allows for the magnesium to be absorbed through the skin uh, without needing any digestion. And so you get a faster, quicker result to relax muscles and to feel calm. Uh, and it's especially useful at night before bed. Um, so um, I highly recommend it to our listeners if they haven't already tried transdermal magnesium. I have many, many uh, clients who've, who thoroughly recommend rubbing it on the abdomen um, to alleviate the pain, not only of endometriosis, but you know your normal premenstrual tension or any kind of period cramps are um, alleviated and relieved very quickly and gently, and you can't overdose that way. You know you're not doing the wrong thing. <laughs> it's not a medication. So the other um, thing to yep. to yeah, mention the, about um, you mentioned about magnesium and cortisol. Um, Cortisol, high, high amounts of cortisol in the body can also affect your estrogen to progesterone uh, balance. And because endometriosis is, and you also mentioned uterine fibroids, there are estrogen dominant diseases. If you have high amounts of cortisol, then you have lower progesterone to balance out the estrogen. Um, and so, you know, without the progesterone, because the cortisol and progesterone come from the same other hormone. So without the progesterone, then you're just causing the endometriosis to continue to grow further in the body and that can lead to further complications. Yes, yeah, swelling, retention of water. So they're all inflammatory conditions. So the body gets, um, uh, I guess it moves into a kind of a panic mode and it affects your emotions as well. Your ability to deal with stress, you become very fragile. The lower the magnesium gets, the more prone you are to estrogen dominance or even if it's not um, too dominant, a little bit goes a long way. So you're more sensitive to it. It doesn't take much to put you in a state of feeling very fragile and emotional. The tiniest little thing can set you off that kind of state of mind. Whereas when you have plenty of magnesium and all the other nutritional elements that go together, to supporting the immune system and the gut health, you feel really strong on the inside. 
you know, you, you, you know, you can respond to challenges and recover very well and you have more positive mindset and more confidence in yourself. And, and then that reflects obviously in the hormone balance, you get a little bit more testosterone, a little bit more progesterone to balance out that estrogen. And so everything uh, works together in, that, in a holistic approach, which is what you do. So it's lovely to see that you're helping and coaching women with meditation and yoga practices because that helps to control that stress um, and the nutritional side. So, so um, what, um, what kind of course or coaching do you offer women? What does that look like? Yeah, so I offer both one-on-one -on -one coaching um, through my endo relief program and group coaching through my uh, Heal Your Gut, Heal Your Life program. So in general, my coaching protocol it consists of a mind, body, spirit approach to healing because we are more than just our bodies. Uh, and really what I do is I take my clients through a healing journey using the powerful healing abilities of yoga, meditation, and you know healing nutrition and food to rebalance and re-nourish the body, bringing it from an inflammatory state to a more calm state of being. And with this framework, my, my clients have actually learned to read their body signals for potential imbalance so that they can proactively meet their needs, trust their intuition, and learn to become more of an advocate for themselves at home, at work, and with their doctor in order to, you know, develop a more holistic life, more balanced life, and create a self-care routine that keeps up with, you know, their daily demands and their physical needs. So you've shown women that they don't need to be a victim of circumstances or symptoms that they can with their mind take control by understanding what the problem is and then dealing with it the right way, creating the right kind of environment. And I, I think that's embedded in a kind of trust that the body's DNA, the body knows what to do given the right tools, equipment and environment. So really we become like farmers. We, we're just making sure that our cells have everything that they need. And then there's the trust that they'll know what to do with it. It'll all um, work itself out because we have those instructions in our DNA. But if you have ingredients missing, you can't bake that cake. You can't come out with the right result. So it's about a holistic approach because we need all the elements working together. And primarily, we need to deal with stress. Stress is really becoming epidemic. Um, people need to take control. And regardless of what's happening in the world or what's on the news or what's on the TV, sit down and just get your center back and know 100% that your mind and your soul can master whatever's happening. You can be in control of yourself. You can shift, change, move. Uh, make the changes you need to adjust and to stay on top. You can do this. And there's the information and the people like yourself out there, Laura, that can help people find that pathway and feel empowered, feel empowered to take control of their life and their health and then experience joy again um, and, and the fun, the fun of living. Uh, when you're healthy, everything is, is, is fun. It's enjoyable and you get excited about doing, you know, whatever it is you do in your mission in life. Um, when when it gets on top of you, and this is, you know, chicken and egg thing, mentally you feel low, you feel defeated, and then that causes a downward spiral because you give in. So I guess the overall message to women is don't give in. And no, that doesn't matter what's happening, that you can overcome whatever if you get the right help and you understand what to do. Would you say that's pretty right? I would say that is absolutely right. And I believe that the body is so wonderful and there's so much about the body that we don't know uh, yet intellectually, but it has its own divine you know, abilities that we can tap into if we just allow for it. And you know, healing is possible putting your endometriosis or any other chronic condition that you might be suffering from is possible. It just has to start with the right mindset. So that's why I take a mind, body, and spirit approach to, to this coaching practice that I have. Well, thank you so much for doing what you do. 
and I'm wishing you all the best in the future. So how can people connect with you if they want to find out more? I can be reached through social media uh, at Island Sea Yoga, or you can go directly to my website at islandseayoga.com. Um, so those would be the best places to, to reach me. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for being on board on the Body Charge podcast today. And I'm looking forward to perhaps doing another interview again with you in the future. That would be great. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. If you enjoyed the video, please share with others. You can also subscribe to our channel to be notified of future videos. To be notified about new blogs and product special offers, please subscribe to our newsletters at electromagnesium.com.au.